Hello and welcome to our Pit Stop Chat, hopefully the first of many, and a, a little series to help teams out with the Green Power Challenge to design, build and race an electric car. Today we're going to be talking about aerodynamics and I have two people here who are experts in their field to help me out. Nash and Paul, hello both. Hey. So Nash, I'm going to throw this big scary question over to you because I know you have a passion for it. What is aerodynamics? So aerodynamics is the study of the movement of air around an object. The probably the most famous application is within aircrafts and it's how the air movement actually allows the airplane to fly in the sky. But there's lots and lots of different applications from motorsport to automotive to building structures and even in sports in terms of like athlete clothing and equipment, for example. So it's it's really quite an important topic um, and one that is applicable to group power as well. So hang on, so people who are just running, aerodynamics affects them as well? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, okay, I'm going to throw this now over to Paul. So Paul, how, how do we know that? How do we study aerodynamics? Well, we study aerodynamics in a number of different ways. Uh, you can observe aerodynamics, you can observe birds flying, you can observe it in nature. And it's been a science for quite some time. Aerodynamics is the movement of fluids, so it's anything, it's boats, it's fish, it's aeroplanes. Uh, everything that you can see that's moving quickly is doing so normally with efficient aerodynamics. It either have evolved, of course, we've designed it. What we do is look at aerodynamics as a science rather than evolution, and there's numerous tools we do that. In recent years, we've been able to simulate it very effectively on computers in computational fluid dynamics, CFD. We can study it using tools like wind tunnels, so really large machines that simulate the world, simulate the air, and normally the ground if it's something like a car. Also, you can do it yourself on a track, and maybe later in this conversation we'll do, work out some ways that you can test your aerodynamics without using those tools, just using the car you have. And you've kind of made a career out of this as well. So, so what is your background? Why are you so knowledgeable in aerodynamics? Well, I hate to use the number, but for 20 years, <laughs> I've worked in Formula One, uh, basically in building the tools that develop aerodynamics. So I'm not an aerodynamicist like Nash. I spent a long time around it and I've got a lot of wind tunnels and other tools uh, to study and develop aerodynamics, but also worked on the science and technology around using those tools and so not just the thing itself, but how you get data out of that that you can understand and use to improve a car. And Nash, you are kind of got a, a similar-esque background. Could you give us a, a bit more? Yeah, similar. So um, I am an aerodynamicist, as Paul said. So my job is to understand the fluid structures and to manipulate them in a way to either give high lift or high downforce or low drag systems, depending on, on what you need. So um, for something like Formula One, you need a lot of downforce with low drag something like automotive you're predominantly low drag systems because you want low carbon emissions so it does vary but my expertise is actually understanding how to do that and then i would work with somebody like paul and together we would develop the methods in order to test and and keep testing until we get the outcome that we need um and i know how to do this because i worked in the automotive industry so until recently i i worked with, with cars and developed them to have very low emissions and, and Paul mentioned fish, but that's in water. So why, why is that relevant, Nash? Because of the shapes themselves. So as we go through the conversations and it will become apparent, certain shapes tend to be more efficient and to have either, like I said, um, high lift structures or low drag structures. And fish are a prime example. Um, if you look at them, the majority of them have very similar, similar shapes. They're very streamlined, which allows them to go very quickly through the, the water, through the fluid. And really the main difference between um, water and air is just the density of it. Cool, but okay, a brilliant overview both of you. So how important is this to green power? Because we're only going at relatively low speeds of 30-ish miles an hour. Um, Paul, does it really have an impact on how far the car can go and how efficient it is? Actually, it really does. You may not think the cars are going very fast, but remember, it's a game of small margins. It's about getting to the end in a further distance than anybody else. And small gains 
what you might think of are going to be relatively small changes to the car will make that difference. If you've got two cars that are very competitive mechanically and one has better aero, it'll stream ahead of it by the end. And, and that you're a former competitor as well. So have you got any actual experience of this whilst working as in the team? I do, yeah. And I can actually put some numbers on some of the bits that Paul was talking about. So within a green power car, you've got three, basically three forces acting. You've got the forward propulsion from your motor and then pulling you backwards. You've got your resistance between your tyres and the road and your aerodynamics. And in green power, the total resistance from aerodynamics is about 75%. So it's quite significant. So like Paul said, if you've got the same efficiency pulling you forward and you've got the same rolling resistance pulling you back, but one's got better area than the other, then you can see very quickly how that's going to make quite a big difference to the whole system. So yeah, understanding the aerodynamics of your cars and perhaps ways that you could make it better is, is definitely something that teams can start to look into if they haven't already. So instead of putting all of your research into designing a really lightweight chassis, you said 75%. So actually, you're better off just making an aerodynamic shape rather than worrying too much about the weight of the car. Well, like Paul said, though, it's all marginal gains. So if you have exactly the same aerodynamics, but one is considerably heavier than the other, well, then the lighter one is going to perform better. So you have to look at it as a holistic system. You have to look at it overall. Um, but yeah, your aerodynamics, you will see more gains by doing that. So if you ever have the situation where putting a bit of material on might give you either a couple of extra grams in weight but versus quite a lot of reduction in drag, then tend to go towards the drag benefit over the weight, the weight hit. So it really is a challenge. That's good to know. It's actually something that people struggle to get right. Um, OK, we spoke uh, generally about it and I think we've got a good overview. So. The teams have written in, they've asked us some questions, and I guess we should dive in and answer those. And one of the first aspects that they've asked is about around the nose and the tail. If you have a tool driver, are you better at focusing on the nose or are you better at focusing on the tail? Because obviously the driver takes up so much of that room and you cannot get the best shape at both ends. So I'm not sure which one of you wants to take this point. It's oh. a large question. Um, and I'll start, then Nash can give you some more of the slides. <laughs> what you're going to find that the answer to a lot of these questions is it depends. And it's really hard <laughs> to do one part of the car without the rest of the car. So, for example, if you've got a very blunt, you know, very flat nose and a nice pointy tail, um, the car still won't be very good. If you have a very messy tail and a beautifully sculptured nose, again, not so good. It also depends a lot on the transition. What you want is a when you look at aerodynamics and how it works, how you attach and detach air off surfaces, which Nash will elaborate on a bit more, it's about the entire shape. So it isn't just about the front and the back, it's how the shape of the car changes over the entire length that's important. So if you look at some cars, you'll see quite a blunt nose and a very sharp tail, more like a teardrop shape. That's a very conventional standard aerodynamic shape. Other cars may be a bit sleeker, but there isn't one particular answer. It depends on what you're trying to wrap, really. You know, if your car's quite big in the middle or you've got a large driver, that cross-sectional area at some points are constrained. You know, that's, you can't go any smaller. So you have to work on how to make the best shape around what you've got. Packaging, as it's called. Yeah. And yeah, completely exactly what, what Paul's just said. It very much depends. Um, as a rule of thumb, we tend to, to work front to back. So... Um, if you've got, if, if you're doing a lot of work at the back and you've got terrible aerodynamics at the front, you can't fix it. You'd have to go back to the front to fix it and then optimise the rear. Um, but you you can't just look at one over the other. Generally, a nice smooth nose, so you have flow attachment, as, as Paul said. So fl uh, flow attachment is where the airflow actually sticks to the surface of the car. And you may get to certain points where the the design of the shape means that the flow no longer wants to stick to it and that's when you get what we call separation and you can feel separation actually if you if you touch the a pillar of a car when you're driving along the road and um, you might suddenly you can feel the wind on your hand and then all of a sudden you can't feel it anymore and that's flow separation the flow is no longer stuck um so if you have a beautiful nose but then you hit a shape where that flow separation occurs whether you've got a beautiful rear or not, not a very good rear, it won't make a difference because you've already hit a regime where your your aerodynamics is no longer optimum. So you do have to look at it as, as an entire entire system. 
And that's why when you look at the cars on the grid, you have so much variation in design. So um, let's, let's take an example. Let's take it roll, the roll bar. So if you look at a kit car, the roll bar sits quite high compared to maybe one of the sand batch cars or, or um, jet. And so you're going to have quite a lot of flow separation behind that roll bar, which means the area immediately behind it probably doesn't matter if you do too much to it um, on a kit car. But if, if you look at jet where it's sitting much lower, you probably will have some interaction with the flow behind the roll bar. And so you do want that to be a streamline, which is why with some of those cars, you end up with the fairing behind the roll bar as well to try and direct that flow. So it's quite it's quite a difficult question to answer without understanding how you want to design your car. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on it, but but do you want your wheels inside or outside? All of those will start to interact um, as well and, and will lead into the overall design. But yeah, a nice round structure at the front is definitely much better than having a blunt nose, but you do need to make sure that you keep an eye on the rear and you don't end up with a very, very square rear when you've got lots of separation and any benefit you've got from the front's just completely disappeared. Yeah. And, and I guess that all makes sense because the air hits the nose first, so everything at that point goes downstream. And as you mentioned, if you make a mistake somewhere downstream, then even further down, it kind of loses its impact. So I guess really when you start to design the car, maybe from what you're suggesting is you, you start at the front, but you want to have a good compromise. And I think the main goal is to make sure that the air doesn't detach from the surface. Is, is that that's kind of what I've got? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that is. The, the other thing with aero design in the world that Nash and I were used to um, is it's very iterative. It's very hard to just start from the front, get to the back and click the button and go, yep, got that right. Uh, which is why you do a lot of testing on road cars uh, and motorsport and airplanes too, actually. Um, and even in the green power world, you can do that. We might talk on a bit later about other ways you can test about you know, trying some simple shapes, but you won't get it right first time for sure. And say it will be a compromise. You, it won't be perfect, but you have to start from the front, work to the back, analyze what you've got there and then start improving the design to iterate it that'll be the only way to make a good car all right well Absolutely. good luck it's to a long process but it's worthwhile <laughs> yeah so we've covered quite a few different areas there around aerodynamics thank you both for your help and your time in this uh matter because i'm really lost there's so much to talk around thank you both thanks for your time those two really know their stuff so what do we learn we learned that up to 75% of the total resistance felt on the car comes from air, and that's really impressive given how easy it is to move through it in everyday life. For minimal drag, you want the air to remain attached to the surface of the vehicle. You can't just focus on the nose or the tail. Transitioning between the two is key to get a really good design. And once you have a design, continue to test it and improve it because you can't get to the perfect solution without doing a little bit of testing. And I think we need to get Paul and Nash back to understand more around that. I hope this has been helpful. And if you have any questions on what you've just watched, please put them in the comments. But for now, thanks for watching.